you open your Bibles with me one final time here to James chapter 5. We'll be reading verses 13 through 20. It's located on page 1175 in your pew Bibles. Please rise as we read James 5 here. Hear now the word of the Lord. Is any one among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is any happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any one among you sick? Let them call upon the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them in oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced his crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them, from death, and cover a multitude of sins. May God bless this reading of his word today. Please have a seat. Well, it wouldn't be the book of James if he didn't end the book, much like he began it, with a problematic and hard passage for us to understand. He doesn't let us off the hook. He's going to make me work for my, my money this week. He, remember he began with that second verse challenging us. He said, consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds. And we had to wrestle with that. So as we're going through this final passage, we hit upon another verse that has proven in the Christian church to be troubling, be misinterpreted, be misapplied, and we don't know quite what to make of it. Well, here in this last section, James goes into the topic of prayer. Remember that for James, prayer is, is the lifeblood of the Christian. It's what we, we do every single day. And he was passionate about prayer. And historically, the, the legend goes that he prayed so much that he was on his knees so often that he developed those huge, knobbly camel's knees that he was famous for having because he was always going to the Lord in prayer. And so, of course... This is how he begins this section. Look again on verse 13 here, where he just urges us in all of life situations, do good and the bad, what should we do? Go to God in prayer. He says in verse 13, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Any among you sick? We need to pray. Pray, 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 pray. He loves prayer. He says there's no life situation in your life that prayer is not an appropriate response. That we are to be talking to God always. That we can't have a great day and go, well, there's no need to talk to God. He says, yes, go ahead, offer up praise. You're troubled, you're having a hardship in your life, pray. And if James left it at that, this would have been a very peppy three-minute sermon, and we'd be out the door and uh, enjoying some more snacks there. But that's not the case. Because here we get into verses 14 through 16 which might be some of the most misinterpreted verses in all of sacred scripture. And ones that the church historically has been divided on and we have a hard time dealing with. And so I'm going to reread these verses as we go into this passage today because I think there is an importance to understanding a clarity of what James is saying here. So again, verse 14, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And you hear, you hear where the problematic passage is right there in verse 14. Prayer offering of faith will make the sick person well. James is very unambiguous about this, that there is a prayer 
that when prayed, will heal a person. All right. So where do we struggle with that? Because it doesn't always seem to be the case, does it? R.C. Sproul famously shares a story of a student that he had named Harvey. He said Harvey was two things. First of all, he was a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. He loved Jesus so much. They were all at this Bible college. He said he loved watching Harvey come in every day because his face would shine with love for God and he was always excited to talk about the Bible. But he said Harvey also suffered from rather extreme cerebral palsy. And sometimes it was so bad he had a hard time just walking. And so he's always struggling to come to class and struggling to get up and sit down and all the other problems that cerebral palsy causes. And so his friends came up to Harvey one day and they said, Harvey, we want to heal you of this affliction. And Harvey said, great, do what you got to do. So they sat Harvey down, they cracked open the Bible of James 5 here, and they laid their hands on Harvey, and they anointed him with oil, and they prayed, said, God, heal this man of his cerebral palsy. Take it away from him. And after this prayer, they sat back and they watched him, and there was absolutely no change in Harvey whatsoever. So they waited a little bit, still no change, and they said, Harvey... This passage is telling you, you need to have faith. You need to believe that God will make you well. Do you need to have this belief in your heart that you're claiming God's healing upon your life? And we will pray for you again. But this time you need to really believe it. Have that faith. Harvey said, okay, I'll do what I got to do. And he summed up as much of that belief, you know, just praying to God, help me to believe. I, I believe in you, Lord. I will claim this, I will claim this healing. They laid hands on him again. They prayed for him. No change. Said, well, your faith is struggling. So his friends came back to him the next day and said, We uh, I think we know what's going on here, Harvey. He says, What? He says, We think you have a demon inside of you. And that demon is preventing Christ's healing from coming into your life. And so we want to cast this demon out. And they lay hands on him, and Harvey's a lot less sure this time around. They lay hands on him, and they do, try to do an exorcism, cast the demon out in Christ's name. No change. And his friends leave him. And Harvey went up to R.C. Sproul in tears because he's so much worse off than he was a week ago. A week ago, he had cerebral palsy. Now he has cerebral palsy. He has been humiliated. He has been told he does not have enough faith in his life. And he comes to R.C. Sproul and says, R.C., do I have a demon inside of me? And he's struggling with this. And R.C. said, are you a Christian? Yes. Then you do not. Because a demon cannot live in the life of a Christian. And R.C. said, I prayed with Harvey. And I said, you don't have a demon, but I kind of worry about your friends at this point. I share this story with you because this, this is an illustration of how some of the verses in our Bible about faith and healing have been taken and misapplied and misunderstood and how it can actually cause harm in the hearts of people. We read verses like this in James. We read verses where it says, faith can move mountains. Or Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, I will, I will give it to you. And we read verses like that as this kind of blank check that we can say now, we, as God's children, we can pray to God and God will give us whatever we want. That we can kind of aim our prayer like a cannon and it will obliterate whatever sickness or healing is in front of us. Prayer is something we can control. But reality tells us otherwise. Reality will tell you that there are miraculous healings. I think most of us have seen some some case where people are miraculously healed, healed against what medical science would tell you is possible. Suddenly somebody is sick on the the doorstep of death one day, and the next day they are hale and hearty, and only God is an answer to that. But for every person we know like that, there are many more people that we know have been prayed over, or we have been prayed over, for healing, and there's no healing. And so we go, well... What's the deal? Is it a question of a lack of faith? Well, if that's the case, 
then we got to chalk up that Paul is a person who had no faith. Because Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12 that he was afflicted. God afflicted him with what was called a thorn in his side, some sort of chronic medical condition that caused him a lot of pain. And Paul says, three times did I pray that God would take this sickness away from me. And three times God told me, no. That my strength is made perfect in your weakness, my grace is sufficient for you, and I do not want to take this affliction away from you. Now, if we want to build up an argument, a case that it only takes faith to heal people, then I think we've got to overlook the fact that Paul probably had a pretty good dose of faith in his life. And if even Paul could pray and God tells him no, and what does that tell us about this phrase right here? Prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. We struggle with this. And this is a hard passage, but I want us to first start, look at this, uh, I think there's a very clear answer to this. First look at this passage in its context, where again, James is urging us in all situations to go to God in prayer. In all situations. We are not to be the judges of what is and is not something we should take to our Lord. He says in all situations, go to prayer, go to prayer in God. You have this enormous opportunity to, to bend the ear of the Almighty, and He wants you to take Him up on it. That we can go to God in the most trivial situations in our life and the most serious, and He's happy to receive us in both cases. That we need to pray in all things. But then James here singles out a person who is sick, and the language here suggests a very serious sickness. A sickness that is not just a sickness in body, but the person's been struggling with it so long that they now have a sickness in their soul. That you can be sick, you can be struggling with situations, and you can feel it in your soul. That you can be sick in your soul as well as your body. He says in that case, that person may prayerfully consider to call upon the elders of the church. That person reaches out to the elders. The elders then come, and then James has this very clear-cut little uh, pattern here. He says they need to assemble. They need to anoint that person with oil, not because the oil has any sort of special properties in and of itself. It's a way to symbolize the anointing of the Holy Spirit on this situation. And the elders are to pray. And then he gives some additional instructions. He asks the elders, he says, I want you to consider as you get together to pray for that person that this sickness may be rooted in unrepentant sin. Now, we need to be very careful here. Because not every sickness, the Bible is not claiming that every sickness and every ailment in your life is caused by your own sin. In fact, there's many passages that go out of their way to say, that is definitely not always the case. The book of Job makes a very strong case for that. But James says there are times that in unrepented sin, God may use a sickness as a form of discipline in your life to pull you back to him. And we see biblical cases of this as well. That in the early church in Corinth, that they were so abusing the Lord's table, and they were treating it as kind of a party, to something trivial to just get drunk. And Paul says, some of you have gotten sick and even died because of the sin that you've been performing in the middle of church. King David, in Psalm 32, says that he had an unrepented sin on his heart. And God caused his body to waste away and become physically afflicted. But he said once he had repented, once he had confessed his sin, God healed him and made him well. So all James is saying is for us elders to consider the possibility and urge the person to examine their heart to make sure that there's no gross unrepented sin on their life that's bringing them away from God and God is using this sickness as a disciplinary action. But in a lot of cases, that's not the case. So the question we struggle with is why aren't these prayers of healing? That if us elders come and we lay hands and we anoint and we pray, why doesn't God answer those prayers? Yes. Why doesn't he do what the scripture appears to tell us that it will do, that God will make the sick person well 100% of the time? Well, the key here is in that second part of the phrase. Because we really fixate on that, 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 that God will make the sick person well 
that we almost overlook or maybe very trivially interpret the first part of that, which is the prayer offered in faith or the prayer of faith. Now I'll tell you ex exactly how certain quarters of the church tend to interpret this. They tend to interpret it as your personal faith as the amount of faith in your life, either the prayer, the faith of the people praying or the faith of the person being prayed for. But my question to you and my challenge to you is, whose faith really is it? Whose faith is James talking about here? Faith is not something that's yours. You may go, wait, what? What? No, that's my faith. I have faith. Well, before I get into that, let me tell you how most people, a lot of people view how we pray to God in faith. This, I use a hot, dog, a hot dog metaphor, and I know it's right before lunch. Some of you are going to get very hungry at this. It's okay. But a good hot dog, in my opinion, doesn't just have one little tiny sad strand of ketchup on it, right? We want to load that sucker up. And so we get ketchup, and we get mustard, and we get chili, we get cheese, and we get relish. We get all the good toppings. That's a good loaded hot dog, and you receive that hot dog well, and you're very impressed with it. And sometimes we view prayer kind of like that, that we're offering up a prayer, but on top of that prayer, we need to layer our faith. We need to pile on our faith. So that as much belief as we can, that we're praying to God and we're like, I believe it, I'm sending this prayer to you with as much faith as I possibly can summon in my heart. And God will receive that and he'll be so impressed with your personal faith that he'll go, you know what, I was going to say no, but wow, that's, that, that, those toppings look incredible. Your faith is so impressive, I am now going to say yes to you. That is not what faith is. We need to look at what faith is to answer this question of why this passage gets misinterpreted and what James is really talking about here. Because he's talking about prayer offered in faith. A prayer of faith. So let's look at what faith is. What is faith? Well, if you ask the average Christian, the average Christian will tell you faith is belief in God. It's a very Sunday school answer. It's a very little kid answer. And it's not wrong. Faith is belief in God, but it's more than that. Because if it's just faith is belief in God, then the Bible says, well, even the demons believe in God, but they don't have faith, right? We're not going to go out on that limb and say demons have faith in God. So faith has to be more than just belief. So I would ask you to expand your definition. That faith isn't just belief in God. Faith is belief in God that aligns to the will of God. That we are not just believing that there is a God and we believe in him, but we want what God wants. We are on God's team. We want to accomplish His goals. We want to see Him accomplish His will in this world. We are not working at cross purposes with God. We are aligned with God. That's what faith does. It aligns you with God so that you're going along on this journey with God. But I'm going to ask you to expand your definition a little bit further than that. One last step. Faith is belief in God that aligns to the will of God and originates in in God. Your faith is not yours. Your faith was not created by you. Hebrews 12.2 tells us very clearly, Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith. That Jesus created your faith, and then, as a gift to you, gave it to you. We often talk about how Jesus gives us grace, and he does, but before he gives us grace, he gives us faith. It's a one-two punch of gifts, great gifts, that before he gave you that faith, you had no capacity to believe in him. You were dead in your sins. You couldn't just spontaneously one day wake up and go, today I'm going to have faith. Today I'm going to create faith in my heart, and I'm going to start believing in God. No, it had to be a, an intervention from the outside that Christ came into your life, and he put faith into you. He gave you this faith so that you would start to believe in him and start aligning your will according to him. But because faith originates in God, everything we believe also comes from God. And Jesus perfects that faith. This is a process in our life. That not only do we start to believe in God prior to our salvation, but after we're saved, he continues to perfect our faith. He grows our faith through the challenges 
and the trials and the temptation, all these things that James has been talking about, he grows our faith. He perfects it. He makes it even better. And every step along that perfection, we want more and more what God wants. We want what we want less and less. I may decrease, so he may increase. And so when we are praying, that's the prayer of faith. God, I want what you want. And so when we see Jesus saying in John 14, he doesn't tell his disciples, you may ask me anything and I will grant it. He says, you may ask me anything in my name and I will give it to you. In my name isn't a little phrase that we just tack on to the end of prayer like it's a a salutation. And then God says, well, you said the magic words. I'm now going to give it to you. What Jesus is saying is that when you're praying in my name, you're praying according to my will. When the leper came up to Jesus and, and wanted healing, he says, Lord, you can make me clean if it is your will. If it is in your name. Because if it's not, I don't want you to say yes. I want you to tell me no if it's not in your name. You pray the prayer of faith that God's will be done. That is what James is talking about here. And 100% of the prayers that are offered up in faith according to the will of God, Jesus Christ will say yes to and he will heal that person. But the problem is we don't know which prayers align. That's why James is saying in all situations, in all cases, pray. Keep offering those prayers up to God and trust that God will sort them out. God will take those prayers and go, this prayer aligns to my will. It aligns to my purpose. And I'm going to say yes, and I will heal this person because it will further the cause of the kingdom and the cause of the gospel in this world, and it will bring me glory. But these prayers do not align with me. And so I will tell them no, because that will also bring me glory, and that will also further the cause of the kingdom in this world. God told Harvey no, because he had a purpose for him to have cerebral palsy. And that may be hard for Harvey, may be hard for us to understand, but it's not hard for God, because God sees his purpose and his plan for all things. So the yes and no both serve his glory and both serve his purpose. But don't forget this last phrase here, because at this point we go, well, why should we even pray? God's going to do whatever God's going to do anyways. Yes, but James says the prayer of the righteous person is what? Powerful and effective. This is not meaningless. This is not weak. When Christians pray, when the saints lift up their prayers, powerful, effective things happen. And so we see cases in the Bible over and over again where King Hezekiah prays in faith and says, God, if it is your will, I'm on the doorstep of death. And God responded and said, I'm going to give you several more years of life. I will heal you so you can live a little longer. When Elijah prayed, fire from heaven came down and consumed the altar. When Daniel prayed in the lion's den, God shut the mouth of the beast. When Peter prayed, a man who could never walk got up. And he stood and he took his first steps. When Paul and Silas prayed, when they were in the depths of a dungeon, God sent them an earthquake to break them out of jail. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, but it's not powerful and effective because you're changing God's mind. It's powerful and effective because God is changing your mind and aligning your will to his. That's what prayer does. It doesn't change God's mind, it changes ours. God is like the parent who can cook breakfast all by himself. He can do it. He's pretty capable. He'll make a great breakfast. But a little kid comes into the kitchen and says, can I help? And the father says, absolutely. Let's get a little step stool. Get up here. Start stirring the eggs. Start stirring the pancakes. I want to include you in this process because it brings me joy and it brings me delight as a father to have my children Enjoy this great work that we're about to do. Breakfast is a great work. But prayer and what God is doing in this world is a great thing. He doesn't need you for it, but he wants to include you in on it. And that should be a cause for celebration. 
that He wants to include you so that when you offer up prayers of faith, God says, now watch, watch what I'm going to do. Sit expectantly to how I'm going to answer those prayers. Because just you watch, it's going to be amazing. And it's going to be thrilling because you are part of this. And it's going to grow your faith. It's going to grow your delight in me. It's going to grow your joy. It's going to grow your love. He doesn't need you for it. But he wants to include you in on this. So we need to get into the game this week. We need to start praying. We need to pray more than we prayed in in the past. In all things. And I'm challenging myself as well as you. In all things, we need to be lifting up to God in prayer because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And that is the promise we need to latch on today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much that You give us faith. Thank You so much that You want us to be included in this process of prayer and to, so that we can witness these great answers to prayer. And Lord, thank You that we don't have to guess what prayers are right and wrong, but we, we can just lift them up to You. And Lord, and we can trust You. So Lord, I pray for this church that Your will be done in the halls of this church that You would bring in the people we need to hear the Gospel, that You would grow this church however You have the purpose to grow it. And Lord, you would strengthen the lives of the believers here. You would answer the prayers of healing, the prayers of of struggles, of finances and relationships, prayers of doubt. All these things that we have in our life, Lord, that you would answer them according to your will. And Lord, open our eyes that we would see your responses, that we would start to become more and more thankful of that, that we would turn around and praise your name and thank you for how you answer us, Lord. Lord, we are your people. We are your children. And we are looking on with excitement of what you are about to do in your church. In your name, amen. Amen. (laughs) Now receive the benediction, and if you would like somebody, an elder, to pray over you today, please come up to the front afterwards. We'd love to do that for you. Hear the benediction from Galatians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Go in peace. That's very simple.